Uh, you can. It's okay with me. Uh, you know, you're the one that's going to. Unless you're stealth nose picking. <laughs> Just turn your camera off. <laughs> Dim for nose pick. Dim for nose pick. Okay. All right. Let's see if we can limp into getting this going. Share any sound today. Check the list. Start the timer. And off we go. Everybody see the uh, whiteboard okay there? Let me just do a little housekeeping here. Have a few late bloomers. Well, I'm going to be on front door duty here for just a little bit longer. So hang in there, guys. We'll get going here. All right, just to kind of re-familiarize uh, everybody with the format here, since it's been a little while since we've done one of these things. Uh, you know, this is an open forum. It's not meant to be necessarily a lecture back to you. So, you know, this is meant to be interactive. I certainly uh, want to get your thoughts as well as share my thoughts on what we're going to talk about today. And the subject today, obviously, is why immersive. Uh, so we're going to talk about, um, really, I'm going to kind of present to you at least my my views on the pluses and minuses of each of the speaker formats. And I, the guy I'm going to give you some credit to with that concept is Scott Sugden. He is in the room today. He's the one that got me thinking in terms of format, using the term format, which I think is very appropriate here. So whether we're in a mono speaker system format, a stereo format, LCR format, or immersive format, and kind of the pluses and minuses of all of those. Because, you know, just like anything in audio, Right, guys? I mean, it's all just a matter of managing your trade-offs. There's no one of those, excuse me while I clear my eyeball, there's no one of those that is perfect, that is, is good in all areas. It's just a matter of, you know, trying to get the best result for the application that you have, right? And uh, as I kind of mentioned to Dennis earlier when we were just kind of chatting before we started, um, you know, uh, one of the things, you know, I, I'm trying to get across, I'm a little on a little bit of a crusade for this because I see this happening so often in our industry right now is when, whenever something else new comes along, right, we have this tendency to, to kind of grab a hold of it and even invalidate it a little bit by, going, by saying, well, that can't be a replacement for so-and-so, you know. Give me, if it's stereo or immersive, you know, I'm just going to stick with stereo. You know, I mean, we, we don't have to make everything a binary argument, right? Whether it, where it's one or the other. Uh, I, I mean, as I said to him earlier, you know, for my money, mono is still viable. Stereo is still viable. LCR is very viable. Immersive is certainly viable. It's just another menu item now in terms of, you know, how we design systems, how we implement them, all kinds of things. Now, immersive, as you're going to see, has far-reaching ramifications into what we do, both in terms of speaker deployment and how we mix back to that, that kind of environment, right? It's going to actually change and challenge some of the things we do, especially in, with regard to mixing music into an immersive environment, right? So uh, there's going to be some challenges there for sure. So I think this, uh, you know, this is going to end up being a set of labs overall. I think we're probably going to end up with at least two, maybe three. We'll get through speaker systems and some of the DSP componentry of it today and then uh, then the subsequent lab uh, unless we really go long over time today and we have to get, catch up uh, with this in the next lab uh, the next one will be focused entirely on object-oriented mixing uh, for music and how we can actually do that and what it means for you know us being out on concert tours whatever where we might be immersive one day we might be stereo one day we might be mono one day how does all that play in because it starts to get really complex and really challenging, but there are some ways to do it, all right? So, uh, let's see. Let's watch the chat here. Yeah, we got a few people in, cool. All right, so let's kind of get it going here. And uh, why immersive? That is the question. And, and I hear this come up sometimes just from, it's like, oh God, really, we're gonna go there now? Why do we have to do this? And, you know, I'll, I'll just preface it by saying, look guys, <laughs> the path is forward right? We're always going to be moving forward. 
It doesn't invalidate the past. It just means we're going to keep going, right? Why would we ever want to get to one position in terms of development and what we do and just stay there forever? I, you know, that would just be so boring, at least to me. I mean, I'm always looking for new ways to present and make music exciting, especially in a concert format. So, I, you know, I was thrilled to see this come along. Now, I'm going to even reveal something to you here. Um, I'll, I'll do it at this time. Maybe I'll, I'll re-address uh, it once we get to the immersive discussion, you know. I, I don't know how many years ago it was now. Maybe Scott Sugden's in the room. Maybe he remembers this. I, I, I don't know if he was there or not. But I got uh, called up by Christian Heil. He, he contacted me and he said, hey, I want you to come to Paris. I want to talk to you about what you're doing with LCR in Concert Sound. And I want to show you something I'm thinking about uh, for Concert Sound. And so we, we, long story short, we hooked that up and I ended up going to Paris and meeting with him. And he was very intrigued in what I was trying to create with LCR in Concert Sound. And he showed me the ground floor, the, the, the DNA, so to speak, of Elisa at the time. And I, I will be the first one to admit to you sitting here, he went through it all and I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I just remember thinking, wow, really? Is this going to work for, for music? I don't, I, you know, I don't know if I'm interested in it. And uh, as again, again, as I say, I fully had missed it. I fully missed it. Uh, and, but I started was, to get it later on, you know, so. I was going to uh, guess that's probably 10, 9 years ago. Yeah, it's right? got to be 2009, 2010, somewhere around there for sure. Were you at that? Were you at that? Those meetings? Scott? I wasn't. I wasn't there that one, but I had very similar conversations with him at the time. And and I'll tell you what, I didn't get it either. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the piece of the puzzle I was missing was the spatialization, you know. And I, I, I mean, I'm almost embarrassed to say it. You know, I had kind of an initial reaction, much like, uh, I think, some people initially react to it as like, well, what? We're just going to hang a lot more speaker clusters now? Wait a minute. That's not what we've been talking about for ages now. You know, we've been talking about more high-powered, lower numbers of speaker systems, you know, low, you know, more coherent arrays instead of these broken up arrays, et cetera. So long story short, I didn't get it. But that said, I get it now. And uh, it's, I think it's one of the most exciting things to come along in live sound in a long, long time. So I, hopefully you'll, you'll get on board the train with me here. So, all right. So here's what we're going to do today. Uh, we're going to compare these different formats, and I've kind of come up with my own criteria. Uh, if your mics aren't muted, please mute them. Uh, my own criteria for assessing these and kind of comparing them. Uh, so I'm going to kind of go through each one of these, and we're going to assess each one of these kind of formats with this kind of thinking in mind, okay? So the first one is Mix Impulse. By Mix Impulse, I mean do all of the elements of a mix arrive at the listener's ear at the same time, right? You guys know I'm, you know, kind of the, you know, I'm kind of the evangelical guy for latency and propagation and all these things. This has to do with do the mix elements, kick, or, or I should say drums, bass, guitars, keys, all of those instruments, do they arrive at the listener's ear at the same time? That's going to be one criteria for evaluation here. The next one is localization. And this is, you know, you can skim right over this one really easily, but I actually think this is one of the most important pieces of this whole thing right now, uh, is the ability to localize. And by that, I mean, when you're looking at someone, do you hear them playing? And more importantly, do you hear it coming from that general area? And this is going to be something I'm going to try to get to you, across to you in this particular presentation, as well as the next presentations uh, that are focused on object-oriented mixing. And we don't want to undersell this. We are not just listening to audio at a concert and in these big settings. We are watching and listening. So there's a, a correlation that needs to take place between that visual element and your, your heard element that is important for engagement, right? So hopefully we'll, we'll discuss that and you'll get, start to get that, that concept as we go, okay? Uh, again, feel free to ask questions or if you want to stop in area, any area for clarifications, anytime you want to do that, we can do it. Okay? Mix separation. This really is just about you know, mix quality as much as anything. How easily can I discern the different elements uh, that have been mixed together? Can I pick the drums out from the bass, from the guitars, from the keys? Can I get all of those elements? Uh, can I hear them all and discern them easily? And what does the array have to do with that? 
coverage capabilities, right? How well uh, can the, our, our given format, our given deployment handle extreme vertical and horizontal geometries? Because we have that in concert sound, right? We are asked to cover more geometry than any typical stereo uh, setup, right? Uh, that might be, you know, whether, for, for whatever it's gonna be, a control room, a listening environment, a home listening environment, you know, whatever. Those medium size, uh, medium to small size stereo situations, they have no coverage demands, right? But we have a very, very large coverage demand uh, with, uh, with PA systems, right? How about acoustic phase and intelligibility, right? And this speaks really directly to, uh, is, the, is the listener being negatively affected by a competing speaker array, right? Is that missing with the intelligibility of what they're hearing in any given location? Uh, so we definitely want to pay attention to that one. We, we probably pay attention to that one more today than we ever have. Uh, and it's nice to see something like Immersive come along, uh, along and actually give us some dramatic improvement in that particular area of it. And then, of course, we, we can't go away without talking about logistical condition or considerations because we're working in live sound on these large productions. There are other elements involved. Set design, lighting design, blah, 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 building size, building scale, building capabilities. All of those things are going to play into whether we can actually do an immersive deployment or not, right? So, uh, and even in stereo, you know, this can be challenging. So, uh, so these are the, the criteria. These are the six criteria that we're going to use to assess each one of these formats and then try to make a decision on which is going to be best for any given situation, Okay. Everybody okay with that? Any, yeah, any questions about the, the criteria there? Anything that's maybe making you go, hang on, I'm not so sure about that one, Robert. I'll explain that a little more. <clears throat> Everybody good? Okie dokie. All right, so let's talk about mono speaker deployments. Mono speaker deployments, all right? So here we go. We're going to take a look at it from the, the perspective of mix impulse. Right? Remember, mix impulse is that all of the instrumentation uh, arrives at the listener's ear in, uh, at the same time. So you're going to see I'm going to mark these with uh, green, yellow, or red, kind of saying good, you know, not so good, and not, not really good at all, or really challenging. Uh, so mix impulse is going to be green for mono, of course, right? Because no matter where we are in the arena or in the listening field, we are only hearing the instrumentation come from one speaker source, right? And all of those instruments are going to arrive to any listening position at the same time, right? So the mix impulse is going to stay glued together really, really well there. Uh, that, that is probably one of the primary uh, advantages to mono for sure. All right, so let's move on to our next one here. How about coverage capabilities? Well, coverage capabilities in mono actually become pretty challenging, don't they? Especially in, in a, you know, an environment where we want to go more than 180 degrees. You know, if we need to get 270 mono, we got some real challenges now, if for no other reason uh, than uh, the fact uh, that we're going to probably create a lot of spill on the stage, right, by getting around to those areas. And, and we all know what kind of havoc that can wreak there, all right? So coverage capabilities, you know, in the environments that we're talking about, that's a challenge for mono, okay? Mono meaning a single speaker cluster mono. How about localization? Well, localization is actually kind of okay, right? So if we were to say, okay, well, I see the singer singing in the middle of the stage. Well, my attention is drawn to the speaker system that is hanging right over the middle of the stage. So those two things are kind of correlated. That's pretty cool. And vocals, you know, one of the most important things to correlate in terms of localization, for sure, you know, when we see somebody, you know, when we see somebody speaking here, we don't want to look at him speaking and hear it come from over there, right? I mean, that's very, very disengaging, uh, you know, especially for things like spoken word and corporate and things like that, you know, that, I mean, but even so, even so for music, you know, it would be great if we can correlate those two things, right? But the other elements of it that we might see on a big stage where we might see a keyboard player off to the left or, the, you know, a guitar player off to the right, that's when you're going to get into that disengagement a little bit where all of it's going to be coming from that one location. You know, the localization of it uh, is not going to be great. And your, you know, your brain is going to be challenged to kind of process that a little bit. You know, I think we've got to get, I'll just take this moment to kind of say, I think we need to try as audio engineers 
especially for live performance, to try to get away a little bit from this idea of I need to build something that sounds great even and kind of disregard the fact that I'm going to be watching somebody perform it. You know, those two things need to be inextric inextricably married together. I, I gave this example uh, recently. I was in a uh, an immersive presentation with Scott Sugden at NAMM, and I said, you know, it's kind of like, you know, watching the band play off in the distance and then having your little Bluetooth speaker sitting next to you at the swimming pool or whatever, you know, those are, that would be very, very hard to correlate that. You know, you see a band, but you only hear it coming from right here. You know, it's not the most engaging. Now, I, I understand that's a completely exaggerated example of it, but you kind of get the idea, right? And uh, we'll talk about this a little bit in terms of, you know, how we do object mixing in one of the upcoming webinars, because if you've ever mixed audio for video, you get a real, real sense of this. I, it was a, I, I did a bunch of that work in the 80s, and it was really revealing to me how important audio support is of what you're visually watching, you know, and have it be right. So I'll elaborate on that later. But in terms of mono, this localization thing, you know, obviously it's got some challenges. How about mix separation? Well, again, in mono, we have some challenges there in mix separation, right? Uh, especially if we've got something that is very dense in terms of instrumentation and even arrangement. I, I would submit to all of you that, you know, if you look back at the, you know, the music that we all love from the 50s and 60s and maybe even in the early 70s, you know, a lot of that was done mono. Even the stuff that was done in two-channel, it was really two-channel mono. It was meant to be collapsed back to mono. And what was a hallmark of all of that, that music? Simple arrangements, simple instrumentation, right? Simple orchestration. There wasn't a lot going on uh, in order to be able to make it really, really read in mono, right? So that's certainly not necessarily a hallmark of live performance. We might have a lot of instrumentation uh, in a very, very wide, very big visual field. So to have this incredible scope of visual information and then have it all kind of tunneled down to this one, you know, one space where we've got to make everything read. That is challenging. That is really, really difficult to do. It's challenging enough to do it in a recording environment, let alone a live performance environment. Okay. All right, let's see here. How about acoustic phase and intelligibility? Well, as you can imagine, this one should be really good, right? The audience is only ever going to hear audio from one speaker source, regardless of where they are, right? So uh, nothing is going to be there to mess with intelligibility and acoustic phase from the speaker system point of view. So that's actually going to be really good there. How about logistics? Well, you know, trying to do a mono, a single cluster mono uh, situation uh, to cover a large geometry. I mean, you've got some serious logistical challenges there, especially if you've got to cover a, a you know, a long vertical coverage. You're going to have this big banana hanging right in the middle of your production, right? And it's going to have to hang, you know, not, it may not be able to hang super high, you know, so you may be limited by truss height, all kinds of things. So there's all kinds of logistical challenges to doing mono in a big space, let alone the coverage. Okay. So you're kind of getting the idea here. This is kind of what we're going to shoot for. We're going to kind of grade, if you will, all of these, uh, these different formats. So mono, obviously it's strong suits are mix impulse and acoustic phase. Uh, localization's okay, but things like mix separation, coverage capabilities, logistics, that is hard to do in large-scale concert sound. You know, we're not mixing through an oratone here. We are mixing through a large PA system that's trying to cover a big audience area, right? All right, let's go on to our next one. Let's get, take a look at stereo, okay? Stereo, this is, you know, this is our bread and butter. We're all familiar with this one. So how about mix impulse? Mix impulse. Well, mix impulse is still going to be really, really good in stereo, uh, right? Because the the group of instruments that you're mixing together is going to be coming out of essentially one speaker system. Uh, you're going to hear, you know, hear it arrive there uh, at the same time. We're not going to; those instruments aren't broken apart into different speaker systems. They're all coming out of one speaker system. So, in terms of mix impulse, this is actually good. So, how about coverage capabilities? Well, and, you know, I kind of qualify this one uh, because we've been doing stereo for so long now. Uh, and, you know, we have the ability to cover large horizontal geometries. 
With line source, we now have the ability to cover really extreme vertical geometries. So, you know, we can get this around the room. I mean, we can make this good. Whether you, whether you want it to be, as I've kind of labeled it, wide, uh, you know, wide mono, which is, you know, you just don't pan very far in order to, you know, keep the mix kind of coherent and uh, readable for a, a large portion of the audience. But in terms of just the speaker coverage capabilities, you know, we can do this really well. Uh, no problems here. How about localization? Localization, this, is, this actually gets a little tougher, uh, but it's still okay, right? So we have a center position here, a center microphone, but the problem we have here is that we have it, uh, you know, arriving from two different speaker sources, right? So the localization can still be kind of okay here. Uh, I, that's why I didn't give it necessarily a red mark here. But the thing that, and this is a really important piece of this to understand, and I, I've got to have you really log this in your brain because it plays into why immersive becomes superior in some ways. I'll, I'll go as far as to say that. You must remember that center components in a mix, in a stereo environment, are created by the addition of two speaker systems, right? I must have both speaker systems equally arriving in equal time and equal amplitude to get that position to be center, right? Whether it's a vocal, a bass drum, a snare drum, those two elements have to be in place, equal arrival time and equal amplitude to get it to be in the center. So as we move off center, this is where it starts to create some problems in stereo. And again, we got to make sure we're in the right context here, right? We're in large format stereo where you might have 60, 80 feet between these arrays, right? So, you know, the offset between these two things, like when you, when you are sitting in between the two arrays, uh, you know, off-centered a little bit, the offset is, it can create cancellation full bandwidth, right? We can get all the way down into the lower bass registers and create cancellation there. And it, is, it almost has always been my take on this. You know, we talk about power alleys and things like that. I think in large scale concert sound, it's not necessarily a power alley. What we've created is two alleys of cancellation, right? That's why that center feels so much stronger because it's more in phase and it's more equal amplitude. But as we start to walk left to right and we get into those positions where we can clearly hear both arrays, but there's offset for the elements that are centered in that mix, then we got some problems, right? And it's going to kind of chew on them in terms of phase response. Now compare that to small format stereo in our homes, in a theater, you know, whatever, that offset is so much shorter and it, it, it just goes so much shallower in terms of frequency response that it's going to cause a problem, right? It's not full bandwidth by any stretch. I mean, even in the room I'm in here, I'm sitting, you know, with some stereo system here. If I walk off just off center to it, I mean, the distance difference is probably, you know, two inches, maybe an inch. That might create one cancellation, you know, at 5K, essentially. But in large-scale concert sound, that cancellation is wide and deep as we walk off center, right? So that makes this a challenge here. How about mix separation? Well, mix separation is still okay here, right? Because we can take advantage of pan in stereo. Uh, we can move things off of center. But again, remember, these positions are created as a result of two speaker systems adding together and us moving amplitude here, right? We're moving amplitude to create that, that offset there, all right? So you can create good separation that way, but it doesn't necessarily play to localization, right? It can, but it doesn't necessarily play to localization. How about acoustic phase and intelligibility? Well, again, this was kind of what I was talking about when we were hitting on localization there. You have, you know, two different arrival times that go pretty far down you know, the frequency scale in terms of cancellation here, the potential for that to happen here. So, you know, if this can really mess with intelligibility, especially on a vocal. I mean, it's really noticeable on a vocal. But I also, I mean, when you talk about moving off center and you, you find those null points for the bottom end, well, what's that messing with? The intelligibility of the bass guitar, intelligibility of the bottom end, intelligibility of the bass drum. You know, all of those th kind of things can be impacted by it when we're working at this big scale, right? So you got to just got to be got to start thinking that way because we have some alternatives now to stereo. How about logistical? Well, the, you know the the 
the entire industry has been so acclimated to working in stereo, you know, two array stereo that, you know, you just say, okay, logistical considerations, we're not going to run into too many situations here where we can't put this speaker system up. You know, you could, for all intents and purposes, you can make this green uh, as well. Sometimes trim height will do it for us here, you know, in line source, uh, with the exception of a couple of speaker manufacturers out there, you know, your ability to cover the vertical is dictated by the length of the line that you can fly. Uh, so that can be in a, uh, in a logistical challenge at times, but uh, overall, good. Okay. All righty. How are we doing so far? Everybody okay with this? You kind of getting the idea here? Give me just a, a read and make sure my mic is still on and that you actually hear me there. I'll take a drink of coffee. Is this making sense to everybody? Yes, sir. It is to me, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. All right, we'll carry on. All right, here we go. So let's uh, let's kind of grade stereo here. Uh, you know, obviously, as I said, you know, mix impulse and coverage capabilities are good. Uh, localization, mix separation, logistical, kind of get an okay, and then uh, you know, for my money. The, you know, the Achilles heel of stereo in this size format is just intelligibility, you know, interaction between the two arrays. Uh, so that's the one that I think gets us in trouble sometimes with it. All right, let's take a look at LCR. And uh, we, I, I'm going to qualify this LCR discussion here today. We're, in the context of this, we're going to talk about it uh, with 100% divergence, right? So if you're not familiar with the divergence concept, we will cover it again in the uh, object-oriented uh, mixing lab, but the, the idea is this. If you are sitting at 100% divergent in LCR, it, all it means is that when I have something panned center in LCR, that information is only coming out of the center array, okay? Only coming out of the center array. I can take it and pan it left, it will go left. I can take and pan it right, it will go right. But if it is centered, and, and anywhere in between, obviously, but if it is centered, it is only in the center array, okay? As opposed to, you know, what I've done in the past using LCR, usually because it was kind of a combination of stereo and LCR, I was almost always 50% divergent. And in that situation, if you have something pan center, it's equal energy in all three arrays. So if I had the vocal sitting in the center, which you normally would, you know, lead vocal in the center, it was actually coming out of all three arrays. And then we did some very clever work to try to keep those arrays out you know, keep them from interfering with each other and, and creating even more intelligibility problems. So, all right, so, but for the pur uh, purposes of this discussion, we're going to keep it at 100% divergent here, okay? So, mix impulse, right? Well, mix impulse, uh, we're going to actually, I, I actually characterize it as yellow here because we can, we're actually for the first time kind of splitting apart the mix impulse here, right? So, if I had drums, you know, bass guitar and vocal in the centered in my mix, it's only coming out of the center array, right? Whereas if I have keyboards and guitars pushed out left and right, well, those are only primarily coming out of the left and right array, right? So think about it in terms of propagation now. You might have a listening position where, you know, if you're standing in front of one array, whatever, you know, you're going you're gonna to be hearing instruments arrive at different times, right? Uh, just because of sound traveling through air, right? That is just the case it's going to be. Now, the question is, how much of that is acceptable? You know, what, you know that's, that's the, this, the discussion in total that we can have here, talking about when we hit the boundaries of this, right? But in this situation, this is the first time we've kind of broken those two things apart, where a, a certain set of instrumentation is only coming out of the center speaker system, and the rest of the instrumentation might be coming out of the left, right, or somewhere in between. All right, so you can kind of see it here. And then if we're standing there, arrival times of keyboards to guitars to drums and bass and vocals is different than it is in that center position, okay? How about coverage capabilities? Well, you know, I kind of give it a yellow again. And it, I, again, just to drive it home here, we're talking 100% convergence or divergence here. So that puts a lot of demands on that C array in 100% divergence, meaning if I've got you know, drums, bass, guitars, or drums, bass, vocal, I should say, coming out of that C array. Well, I've got to have enough coverage in that C array to cover the rest of the room, right? So, how, you know, how important is it to cover the rest of the room with the C array? Do I need to create down mixed fills in the offstage? 
What do I do for front fill? All sorts of things. But in the midfield and far field back, you know, it's really, really elegant to have that, that kind of divergence in there. It, 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 it begins to create the sensation that we're going to run up against in, in immersive. How about localization? Well, and again, here we get improved localization, right, compared to stereo, because uh, if I'm sitting in any one position, right, the vocal, the drums, the bass, if he's hanging around the center stage, are gonna sound like they're coming from where I see them, right? Now, if we've got a bass player that's running all over the stage, let's, let's just keep that out of the argument for just a few minutes. But in terms of a vocalist center, the drum center, they sound like they're coming from where I see them. And there's an, a, a better element of engagement that is going to happen as a result of that. Same sort of thing comes for keyboards, right, and guitars. If I've got keyboards on the left side of the stage and I have them primarily coming out of the left side, guitar on the other side, primarily coming out of the right side, again, these, you know, it will, our, our brain kind of manages this a little better. You know, it kind of says, wow, okay, I see the keyboard player, I hear the keyboard player. I see the guitar player, I hear the guitar player. You know, your brain kind of mends it a little bit and says, that's cool. As opposed to if you were just sitting there listening to it, purely listening to it, it might actually end up sounding odd. You might pick up the time uh, offsets there, okay? How about mix separation? Well, of course, mix separation is going to be a green here because we're actually uh, separating those elements out into b different speaker systems now. So there, there's going to be an element of clarity there that is easier to attain uh, I mean, they are separated in and of themselves, so mix separation will be a little easier to create there as well. How about acoustic phase and intelligibility? Obviously, a, an improvement there as well. Again, because we have, you know, a single source, a single speaker delivery system kind of given for any one source. If I have something panned hard right, it's only coming from that speaker system. Uh, you know, it's not a, a function of being panned how do I want to say this? It's not a function of amplitude uh, compared to the left side. It's actually in between that center and right, right? So, uh, you know, it becomes a little, uh, or certainly in terms of acoustic phase, is better here with those single speaker system coverages. Logistical considerations. Well, you know, this is kind of a combination of, as I learned for many years, of doing stereo and mono and trying to get, man, I'll just tell you the, the fight that I went through in my lifetime trying to get that center cluster, you know, hung in position that I thought it was going to do the right thing within the arrays was uh, very tough. I, I literally had to fight tooth and nail to get that in place with lighting designers, set designers, everybody uh, to get that in place. Now, in fairness to them, I would say this. After doing more work immersively now, I think I would actually fly my LCR components differently if I was going to go back out and do that today. I, there's some, it's made me think a little differently about how I would handle that, and I would probably do it a little differently than I've done it in the past. All right, so let's, let's grade LCR here. All right, so mix impulse, localization, mix separation, all those different things kind of as you see there. We'll, we'll sum this up at the end, too. We'll compare them all side by side. So. All right, let's get to the big guns. Here we go. Let's talk about a, a front field immersive here. Now, uh, I don't know whether this is actually legal to say it in this way, but I've kind of I've just kind of co-opted this concept of immersive and broken it apart because I, I think the the initial thing that people gravitate to the minute they hear the word immersive is that it's 360 degrees, right? And it doesn't have to be. Certainly in concert sound, it doesn't have to be. So you know anything that's sitting in this front field like you're seeing right here, which is five arrays, be five, seven, however many you want, really. I consider this front field immersive because it's going to require object-based mixing to use it really effectively, to, to use it optimally, okay? Now, that's not to say we can't add surround to it, but I break those two things into different arguments and different agendas. There's the front field immersion, and then there's the surround immersion. They, they're all part of the same spatialization, but in terms of just being able to manage and speak to it, especially in the context of mixing music, I, I find it necessary to break those two things apart, right? Because, and, and maybe I'll even qualify that, especially in the context of mixing live performed music, then yes, I, I've got to break those two things apart because there are things that can get you into trouble here in terms of propagation, all right? So let's go through this. And then I'm actually going to invite my buddy Scott Sugden in. I hope he's got his documents ready. I asked him...
to kind of bring together uh, some software to back up some of these concepts I've been saying. So hopefully you'll, you'll be able to do that for us today. So let's take a look at it in terms of mix impulse first, right? So mix impulse, uh, you know, again, we're going to kind of break apart the mix impulse that we would normally send to stereo because certain instruments are going to be coming out of certain speaker systems and arriving at different parts of the room at different times, right? And again, this is all about creating kind of a, you know, kind of a guardrail in terms of how effective we can do this and, you know, uh, and still have it be effective for the music. You know, we don't want to damage the music presentation, uh, but we do want to engage people to what they're seeing, right? So Mix Impulse is going to get broken apart here, and this is going to be one of the trade-offs that we're going to concede to do immersive for music. So as you can see here, if we're sitting in the center of the room, arrival time is, is going to be good, but the center elements are probably going to arrive earlier than those elements that are out on the stage, right? Same thing if we're sitting off left or off right, we're going to create different arrival times. It's going to be a different sounding seat without a doubt. But, I, you know, I always say this, you know, when people ask me about this and they seem to get a little squeamish about it, I was like, does every seat look the same? Does it look the same regardless of where you sit? So, and the, of course, the answer is no. So how about we get some audio that is more supportive of what you're seeing uh, and see if we can get it to engage those people a little more. Coverage capabilities, uh, you know, this is still a very new time uh, for immersive, even though for as long as it's been around now, I think we're still very, very young in terms of what it's gonna require uh, for the uh, for the coverage of the arenas and stuff, you know, especially in the big format. Uh, you know, I think what we're going to see over time, we'll talk about this right toward the end, is that we're going to actually have want speaker systems that have much wider queue than what we currently have. You know, we've been for many years now been on this kind of crusade to get, you know, very tightly defined, very tightly organized uh, coverage patterns out of these line sources. And, it, and it's been a huge benefit. Don't get me wrong, it's been a huge benefit. But in immersive, it can actually work against you a little bit where we might want a given array to cover more of the space, right? So uh, that's why I give it kind of, at this point, kind of red. That's one of our challenges. But there are actually some uh, things that happen within the spatialization that allow us to actually extend coverage and do some really cool things. Hopefully, uh, I can get Scott to come back maybe at the next lab and we can talk about those capabilities in Elisa because they're actually really cool. How about localization? Well, this is where localization, I mean, this is where the immersive uh, deployment really shines in terms of localization, right? Where we, we might have, you know, if we've got a vocalist center that's coming out of one speaker array, we've got a keyboard player left, he's essentially coming out of one speaker array and right on down the line, right? We can have this, uh, be there. And, and the thing to remember in, in immersive, right, the resolution for this improves with more speaker clusters. If we went to seven, if we went to nine clusters here, then the resolution of being able to place that localization in that listening field becomes much higher, right? Because we don't rely on two speaker systems to provide any one position. It's one speaker system to provide a localization. So the, the more speakers we have, the higher the resolution, right? So sound companies will be glad to hear that. We're going to rent more speakers, right? <laughs> Loudspeaker manufacturers as well, Robert. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Thank you for that perspective. Yeah. Aren't you guys giving them away for free? I thought, wait, wait a minute. That yeah, wasn't deal. part of the deal. Yeah. Yeah, buy 500 and get one free. Right. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about uh, mix separation here. Mix separation obviously is a is a great asset in immersive. You know, you can make things so readable within a listening environment, you know, just by pushing them out there and getting them to sit where they are. And I, and I will say this in terms of mix separation. Uh, again, I'll go back to my uh, discussion of mixing for video. Once you can engage something visually and then hear it supported there, your perception of actually how loud it is in the mix is changed. Uh, maybe I'll tell this story now and maybe we'll retell it uh, later. Uh, in the, in the mid 80s, mid late 80s, I started doing some mixing for uh, film work, for video work, music video. And at that time, you know, synchronization was still a challenge. I mean, it was still hard to do. And in most of those situations, you had to have the video machine had to be the master. Uh, so audio had to chase whatever was going on in video. And it was just brutal to try to get in and work in that environment. So it's because we were in, you know, maybe we were in, you know, 
48 tracks of analog or whatever with two two inch machines slaved together ssl you know in charge of that transport video in charge of the ssl transport i mean it got so messy and so clunky so what i did in the early days of it was i would take the video offline mix the audio then resync and check it back against the, the video and what i kept all of a sudden it, it just was crystalline to me i started realizing oh my gosh my perception of the mix is changing depending on the camera cut, right? When it's a wide shot and I can see all the band members, my mix actually sounded really good. Zoom into an ISO on the piano player. It's like, wow, why are the keyboards so loud now all of a sudden? They hadn't changed, but my perception of it had changed, you know? And a very similar thing happens here uh, in this live environment where if you can engage something visually and localize it, you know, your brain kind of, says that's good i like that let's let's keep those two things together okay how about acoustic phase and intelligibility right well obviously another really big bonus here in immersive when we do this right because we only have any one speaker system uh providing audio to any one listening zone right so it, it, the, the the intelligibility is actually really really high in immersive and logistical considerations obviously this is the new kid on the block it's got the biggest challenges, but I also believe, I'm going to say this right here and now, I also believe this has the most potential in the long term to be accepted uh, by big productions, uh, et cetera. We'll talk about this in the summation at the end here, but I, I think this has way, uh, way more possibilities uh, in terms of being able to do something very effectively, but it's going to put more demands on the speaker manufacturers to make a speaker system that is nimble enough and dare I say, small enough to do these kind of regular deployments, okay? All right, so let's just compare these here. Actually, I'll just take us right to the summation here. So let's take a look at these formats and just compare them. And as you can see, no one, you know, gets 100, you know, 100% here, gets high marks on every element of it. So it's a matter of just balancing your trade-offs here and uh, finding what's gonna be right for your given situation. But uh, yeah, I'll just, like I said earlier, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I cannot wait to get out and do some shows immersive and just see what it's all about. I, I really think it's going to, even just the limited amount of I, that I've done already, I absolutely love it. Uh, but there's, there's challenges that come along with it, all right? So at this point, actually my friend Scott is here. So that is very good to see. Uh, Scott, let me, um, See if I can make you a co-host here. Ooh, let's see if this works. And I'm going to let you share a screen. If you have, are you okay with doing this? Are you okay with pulling up uh, some sound vision here? Is it working? Can somebody tell me it if is. they see me? I hey, see that. magic! Yeah, I see it. Excellent. All right, so that it, off. if you guys are, are not familiar with sound vision or L acoustics, etc. You know, this is their prediction software, and they have an, uh, a version of it that works for Elisa. And it's just an incredible visual tool to kind of validate or invalidate some of the stuff that I just spewed at you for the last 35 or 40 minutes here. So uh, Scott's going to hopefully take us through a couple of different deployments here. And Scott, if you, you know, if you can, if you have the ability to do it quickly, you know, it'd be great to look at, you know, just in terms of frequency response and impulse and coverage capabilities you know, kind of readdress some of the things I just talked about here. So I'm going to turn you loose here for a few minutes and drink some coffee. Excellent. Well, thanks, Robert. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, inviting me, by the way. Mm. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar, this is L Acoustics uh, proprietary 3D modeler. It's completely free, so go download it right after this if you don't have a copy. Um, I am running a special design mode for Elisa. So to get that, you do have to go to a training as a, uh, it's a fairly deep set of logic to understand. Um, but all the basics here work the same. There's just some interesting tools we get to play with. Um, today's gig, uh, we're, we're all loading in in uh, 30 minutes. Uh, bus calls in 15. I've built us a little uh, 60 meter by 60 meter square. So let's call that, uh, what is that, 190 feet, 100, 200 feet by 200 feet. And um, just to keep things simple, I've put in a hang of 12 K2, which is a large format uh, line source we use at concerts, right? Um, so what this mode of sound vision has, it's a little bit different is we can do the kind of rendering you would expect, um, 
in a, any 3D mapper so we can see the SPL distribution. And in fact, I'm going to switch this over. There's a mode here to make it step so we can see the color distribution. Um, every 3DB is a color change. So what I love about this is uh, uh, what we understand as audio professionals and the producer doesn't is that the audio doesn't change dramatically 3DB at that row. Um, but uh, uh, we can see the kind of the zone of, of 3DB regions. And, and what I've modeled out here is is just our coverage of a single center cluster. And as Robert pointed out, um, you know, it's, it's not too bad as long as we don't end up with really wide seating off to the side. Um, we can deal with this in, in a number of environments. We just have to get permission to hang a giant cluster above the audience. Um, if we need to extend the coverage, well, then we, we add a, a fill speaker to the sides, maybe a cluster on each side to do the same thing. Um, but since we're sending the same signal to all of these sources, we start to introduce modulation or destructive interference. So it's kind of a, a well understood aspect here. Um, and this is in the low end right now. I've got 100 to 200 Hertz selected. I could switch this to a weighted and we'd probably get a pretty kind of stable picture. Voila. Uh, Robert, are you still a host? Cause someone is admitted here or something like that. You want me to manage it? Are you taking care of that? I'll take okay. care of that. Scott. Yeah. Cool. All right. So um, this is mono and we can take a look in, in how do we extend coverage? We add, additional clusters um, to fill to the sides, uh, which is fine. So what's interesting and unique about this version of SoundVision is that it's got a mode where we can assign a unique noise generator. So think of this as um, uh, all of us went over to uh, ratsound.com and bought a bunch of pink sticks, right? Um, and we, we plugged them into every channel of the, of the Avid SXL. Um, and so now we have a bunch of uh, uncorrelated sources. So what I can actually do here, for instance, is, is assign these all the same correlated signal and we see that comb filter. But as we go to stereo, we can start to see what happens if we were to assign two different signals versus one signal and see the difference between them. Um, so mono, great, exciting stereo. Here's two arrays exactly the same size as before. Let me jump out of this real quick. So these are the exact same array that I had in center. I did nothing different. I just put them uh, nine meters, let's call it eight meters. So what is that? 27 feet, 26 feet to the side um, for Americans. Um, and our top trim is 14 <laughs> feet. Yeah, I know the rest of the world figured it out a long time ago. Bottoms at 10. So we're 30 feet off the ground, 32 feet off. So this is plenty high. This is a concert trim for a bottom elevation of 30 something feet in a stadium or an arena. Um, and we can take a look here. And the big question always is what percentage of people are in the sweet spot of stereo versus who hears dual mono and here who's who hears mono mono, right? Um, so what I've actually done here, I've got the left and right array and I've signed them both to this signal one. So they're on the same pink noise generator, if you will. So if I map this in Elisa mapping mode, what it tells me is everyone in green is within my defined time characteristic, okay? And SPL characteristic. And everyone dark green is outside of my defined time characteristic, but within my defined SPL characteristic. So in this case, uh, uh, since everyone panned the lead vocal center, if you're in the green zone, uh, he or she's vocal arrives within our time window. And today's time window is eight millisecond. So I've given us a pretty loose uh, time domain there, eight millisecond. And I've asked for an SPL window of six dB. So everyone here hears left and right within eight millisecond within six dB. But everyone over here hears it actually offset by at least eight, uh, eight millisecond. Um, and what's interesting here, let's pop up my little calculator. 20% of my audience area is in what we would call the stereo sweet spot. Okay. So 20% of my audience area is in this bright green zone. Another 45%, let's call it, is in the dark green zone. We're covering an additional 27% in only one speaker cluster or mono, right? Um, so that means a third of our audience is mono. So as a mix engineer, we're probably gonna mix this more mono than more stereo, knowing that if we mix something hard left, at least 20 something percent of the audience isn't gonna get the full mix. Um, and we're missing 8%, so we're missing the sides here. We need a couple fills that I didn't do. And that's with an eight millisecond window, right? Um, we can manipulate that and there's a delay mode in SoundVision. We can see that same time delay sequence here. Let's calculate that. Great. So if I click over here, what we actually see is that the left speaker arrives at 95, 98 dB, pardon me, 111 millisecond. And the right one is 93 dB. So there's only 40 dB difference, but they're 25 millisecond off. 
right? So think of a snare hit in that position. So what does every one of us do? We all do the exact same thing when we fly a stereo PA, which is we pan it away from each other as much as possible to mm -hmm. limit. So let's go ahead and try that today. You know, I was bringing this up to Scott last time we were talking about that. Think about that in terms of a festival, right? A big festival. Who's getting stereo? All the people in the aisle way that lead out to front of house. So meaning all the security guards and the front of house. Yeah, yeah. They get the perfect audio and nobody else does. <laughs> nobody else does. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. So in this situation, as we start to pan it out, we're just trying to bleed or limit that overlap. So let's, know, let's go crazy here, Robert. How far did you usually pan out? You were usually, you were pretty extreme, weren't you, if I recall? Well, I, I was, but most. keep in mind, I was doing LCR, you know, so I Oops. had some center coverage. You but it, typically it was about, gosh, Matt McQuaid's in the room. He might know better than me. I want to say it was about eight degrees. Although Matt did, Matt did annual with me, not the, not L acoustic. So I'm going to say it was about eight, maybe 10 degrees. Yeah, I mean, I look at the the Hollywood Bowl where I, I do the design there, and we're panned out about five, four, yeah. five, um, and that's that's twofold. We're trying to help the coverage a little bit to the side, but um, you know, I, I'd argue that three or four degrees of horizontal pan on a line source array is not exactly a catastrophic amount one way or the other. Yeah, if, I um, mean, if I wouldn't have had the C array, I wouldn't have panned it out that far for sure. So here is. 15 degrees of pan, right? And so I've gotten that that bad timing zone down to about 12%. And I haven't really affected the stereo zone though. So everyone here is actually still getting the same stereo quality, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting. So I, I like this tool because I'm using this just in designing a stereo PA. I'm not actually designing an, an immersive PA of any kind, right? We're not even LCR, but we can, we can keep stepping this up and we can go instead, let me hide all these. And we can hop into stereo here, or sorry, LCR. Solo that one. All right. All right. So same thing, same coverage as mono, right? We've got left and right um, doing their same coverage. And I'll flip this to SPL. It'll look a little nicer. Um, so left, center, right. Um, and now the thing is, if we're doing 100% divergent, like Robert talked about, we have to be concerned where where is, where are, pardon me, all of these overlapping and within a similar enough SPL window, because the very first thing we have to make sure we always have in a mix or in a PA coverage uh, system design is coverage, right? If we don't have coverage, it doesn't matter how good our time alignment is. Um, so that's the very first step to think about. So this Elisa mode will let us look at all three of these overlapping. Let me make sure they're all set independent. One. Yeah, two, I would three. even submit to you, Scott, that uh, if you're in 100% divergent, uh, overlap is less of a, a concern than coverage. And if you go back to 50%, then overlap becomes the, the concern and not the coverage, right? Well, yeah, and, and I'll say the interesting aspect here of a, a LCR and as we step up into immersive multi more than three, right? Um, yeah. You know, if we do 100% diversion, we have the bass player over here, right? You got to remember that this is the coverage pattern for everyone for the bass, right? right. <laughs> so if you're over here, you're down on the bass, this is down three, down six. So your bass is going to be 60 dB less loud on that side. Yeah. And if you pan the guitar hearts, right? Same thing. This guitar is going to be less loud. So let's think of that guitar zero, guitar minus six, bass zero, bass minus six, right? right? So for everyone in the audience listening, right? Um, you're in the middle thinking everything's well balanced because you're in the same color for all three mixes. Yet this person gets plus six dB of bass, hopefully bass girlfriend over there and hopefully guitar player girlfriend over on the other side, right? Um, and that works out okay. Yeah, but you know, I, I mean, we have the same problem. It just manifests itself differently with stereo. Right. Right. Where, you know, it's not that the bass guitar is less, less loud in a part of the room. It's less amplitude because it's been hacked to death with comb filtering. As right? well. That's, that's the reason it's like, if we go off into the corners of a typical hockey arena, that's why the low frequency response is so poor up there and why the bass guitar does not read well up there because of the offset between the left right arrays right that's a situation where both arrays are providing that center image but yet is providing offset to the corners and to the off stage right well so it's, and it's not just a matter of the bass guitar being lower in volume it's it's, it's also diminished in quality too. as well yeah right? absolutely well and your, your ears are actually really well tuned to accept a change in amplitude much more than a change in frequency response that is my point that is exactly yep. my point and, and and we all know this actually i mean um a well put together vertical line source um 
there are two ways to design that, right? One way number one is this idea that you want the same amplitude front to back of the venue, right? And so we see people do that and they make it equal out in the back as the front. The problem is that doesn't work at all frequencies. Um, it works at mids and highs. And unless you have an exorbitantly long line source, it doesn't work in the lows at all. Right. And so you end up with a, a large spectral shift as much as a, a, an amplitude shift. And your brain will pick that up so much more. Um, and I'll go back to the Hollywood Bowl real quick, Robert. I mean, the number of front house engineers who have texted me out of breath when they get to the top and say, man, it's the same volume here as it is at mix. It's actually seven dB less loud but the amplitude or the frequency response hasn't changed. Right. And so they don't trigger their brain. They're also out of breath. It's like red rocks, right? You don't remember that you've. <laughs> so they're not they're, out of breath with excitement. They're no, just, no, they're just, they're they're just out of breath. They're just out of breath, right? So <laughs> I'm going to toggle this back into this mode here. So here's what's interesting. Where do they all overlap? So let's, let's overlay these maps and we start to see that in an LCR flat, I'm calling this flat. It's not panned in or overlapping ideally. Um, we're getting 65% of the audience in the LCR zone, right? The other 27% isn't. So someone over here potentially isn't getting full mix yeah. or somebody over here isn't getting full mix. So that means you're required to put fills in of some kind to supplement the, the mix at those points. Um, temporally, they're, they're probably challenged. Um, and we can see that if I switch all of these to the uh, one source here, hold on. Uh, yeah, I, I'll tell you, Scott, I, I think if I would have seen this information when I originally started going LCR, I, I would have actually deployed it a little differently from the console. Yeah, I, exactly. It's just opened my eyes to a few things that I didn't think were possible, you know, so. Right. Well, so here's what I did. I said everything, everything to be the same signal. And now all of a sudden we kind of have a similar sweet spot zone. It's 20% like stereo was, mm -hmm. right? So it's not inherently improved at all in terms of who gets the good timing information. Um, what I've done here, Robert, as well, I've actually done uh, what most people don't do, which is I've taken the arrays and I've towed them in as much as possible in an LCR. Let me unhide that one and hide those. So these have actually attempted to overlap as much as possible. And this is kind of starting to get towards what we want to do with an immersive system is, is try to overlap coverage as much as humanly possible. And it's the most counterintuitive thing. Um, but we end up in a situation here where we can get 78, 80% of the audience now is in that multi-channel environment in terms of its coverage, right? Um, the, the big question is how does this affect um, in terms of like uh, panning resolution, right? So, so how, how accurate is this for what's happening on stage, right? right? And that's where the next step is, is to go a little higher resolution and that's what I've done. So um, once again, I, this is going to be overkill in terms of performance, but here's a center array, just like our mono array was, nothing different. And I've added a pair to each side and outside of that, a pair to each side, which is where the left and right are. And what we end up with is a situation where we get about 80% of the audience in the spatialized zone. And at this point, this is the sweet spot of an immersive environment versus maybe the 20% we get in stereo, right? And so everyone in here will hear all these signals within that SPL range and within our time window. So we'll still accept the time offsets. And what I mean by that is, Imagine, Robert, your, your bass guitar player is running back and forth across the stage and you put a tracker on them. As <laughs> yeah. they move from array to array, of course, that processing engine has to deal with that. And we want to make sure when we deal with that, we don't have huge problems, right? So there's a time window that that's acceptable for. And there's a time window that it becomes a, a bridge too far, right? So if we try to pan all the way from left to right, that's, that's a little hard for everything to work well together. If we try to pan within a certain amount, that works pretty well. You know, it makes um, me start thinking you know, my brain starts going off and thinking, well, maybe what I should do is have the tracker affect only the bass guitar above 500 hertz. You can, right? But um, so the Lisa functions a little differently than most. Um, uh, the The panning is is the stability of the movement of the objects is a function of two primary parameters, right? The, the algorithm itself is, is quite good and it ensures that when you pan something, you don't get a tonal shift. Yeah. So if you think of that, if you pan an object between two sources and those sources are close together, the low end will couple. So you'll actually get plus three dB, right. but the high end and the mid wouldn't necessarily do that, right? So you don't get that boost. So as you move something around it, it ensures that the tonality remains stable. That's a help. The second thing is des purely design-based. I, I didn't say what I was thinking was right by any stretch of the imagination. I'm just saying that's what I would start thinking, you know. Yeah, yeah. I would treat it as two objects. I would treat it, I would cross it over and say, 
Okay, one object, you're base low frequency, and now object two, you are base high frequency. Well, you know, I'll, I'll go back. To, interesting, you know, you, you, you picked a, Christian picked your brain 10 years ago, right? And, and that went on and off for a, a while. Um, but maybe five years ago now, four or five years ago now, we were, were trying to figure out how to deal with immersive audio in terms of, of, of practicality. Um, and LF needs, especially for pop rock, EDM, that kind of thing. Yeah. And one of the specific challenges is, oh, let's just hang five arrays of giant speaker sources. And I think uh, I saw five or six people say in the, the chat, uh, no one's going to pay for that. Um, and, and I'll argue you, I don't think that's true because um, they pay for it with every other department. Um, you know, but uh, let's, let's run with that. So I think we always have to be efficient in our designs. Um, and, and so some of the thought was, well, how do we do that? Because if we hang five arrays of speaker clusters as big as left and right used to be, that's that's 2.5 times more expensive at minimum, right? If not, if that's assuming a linear scaling of everything. Um, and that's not even yet going beyond the stage. That's just kind of our stage environment. So, so one of the things was, hey, do these all have to be equal in scale? And there's an interesting side benefit versus left and right with immersive audio. So I, I think I used this analogy with you the other day, Robert, of... Um, uh, if anyone here in the chat has a pool and teenage uh, boys, um, they'll be very familiar <laughs> this, with this. Yeah, this is awesome. Um, but the thing is, when we have a left and right speaker system or even an LCR speaker system, if we put energy in all three of those, it's like your, your, your son and two of his friends all jumping in a pool at the same time, but in different spots. And it does make waves. And those waves do sometimes combine into really big splashes and sometimes they cancel out and there's a calm corner. Um, however, if all three of them were to jump in the pool holding hands at the same spot, they knock half the water out of your pool, right? So same start energy, but better return on your investment for the entire pool. And, and immersive audio is the same way. If we take a bass guitar and we put it in one speaker versus two, the net is about plus three dB on the audience. Because when we take the same signal and spread it amongst two sources, we only get 3 dB efficiency gain, decorrelated sources, even though we've got twice as many speakers, plus 6 dB. All right, so inherently, we can get a little bit louder with the same amount of speakers, or we can do it with a little bit less speakers and get to the same volume. Um, the second thing is, if you move a low-frequency rhythm object, think bass, uh, drums, piano, and you separate them too far apart, we end up with temporal shifts in the audience that change the feeling of the music. And so we did some testing on this and some listening, and, and it was uh, uh, very much a combination of subjective and objective. And it turns out more than about a 10 millisecond shift in the rhythm really starts to bother you, right? So you can, your brain will put it all back together, but, but more than 10 millisecond and the, the groove changes. So mixing wise, it might be okay to you in the middle, but you really can't pan, you know, the bass on one side and the drums hard on the other because some of the audience will experience the bass early by 30 millisecond and some would experience the drums early by 30 millisecond. So all of this means we got to put all the rhythm kind of like they're on the stage in the center. Um, so it really starts to mitigate how we design and we say, okay, these three center rays have to be a little larger than the rest. Um, and, and that's an interesting aspect as well to, to, to think about. And that helps us because now three rays pretty big, um, maybe those three equal the power we used to have in left and right. And then we just start to have uh, uh, more speaker sources to widen the panorama and, and make more separation capability for your mix, but they don't necessarily have to capable, capable of doing the kick drum at full vo volume or the, right. the bass guitar at full volume. Yeah, I, you know, I'll share this with the audience, uh, Scott. You know, I, the best example I saw of this, and, and honestly, it was kind of what, I don't want to say sealed the deal for me, but pretty doggone close. Uh, was going to see Bon Iver at uh, Santa Barbara Bowl. And they did that immersive. And they had two drummers, right? And, uh, man, I mean, anybody in this room, I know Dave Morgan's done it with the Doobie Brothers, but anybody that's tried to mix two drummers knows the challenges that come along with that. And in this situation, they had a drummer stage right and a drummer stage left. And they didn't put them in the center, right? They, they pushed them out a little bit into the immersive field. And... I, I mean, I, it's going to sound like I'm fluffing it and over-exaggerating it here, but it was incredible. I mean, I, it didn't matter where I walked in that venue. I could pick out every stroke that was being made by either one of those drummers and, more importantly, know which drummer was doing it. You know, I mean, it was just incredible to be able to localize those two things, regardless of where I was in the horizontal or vertical field there. I mean, it was, it was impressive. I just, I just walked away going, holy cow. Okay, if that's if that can happen here, count me in. You know, yeah, and it's it's the the thinking differently of design, right? Like 
like LCR is a very valid solution for a lot of applications, you know, where stepping up to that next envelope of object-based mixing and immersive um, might not be necessary in a certain size venue, right? Yeah, um, yeah. It's just we have to think differently about how we design it. And this idea of taking all my speakers and overlapping coverage seems like the most counterintuitive thing in the world because we all know that we mostly mix mono. Yeah, not so and immersive so you, though, right? Yeah, that's, exactly. That's, I that's mean, exactly. it's a great, great point, right? And, and I think you made a great point too of like all of a sudden, listen, in, in this design in Elisa right here, um, for example, and this is, this is true of 97% of immersive algorithms and environments, the coverage of the center cluster is, is really your, your primary mitigating factor to what you can do. Right. And so, as you said, you really want wide coverage as possible to get as much of that audience in that, that primary field. And you also need high power, right? It's a, it's kind of a catch 22. You need really wide and really high power. So we yeah. need high power density and, and lots of width, um, you know, uh, and that's that's not always an easy thing. I, I saw a question earlier I thought was great, which is, and you brought it up, Robert, is it, is it the resurgence of point source? Very well could be on small scales, but as soon as you get up to a certain size scale, point source usually doesn't scale well in terms of SPL for large venue. Yeah, I think that was um, the first question in the door today. Um, yeah, so this is this is what we can do. We can kind of like, if, if, if we have questions, we can kind of dig through it. And I can use this to visualize it, Robert, if uh, if anyone has anything or if you want me to, to show anything else. I also have the, the spectral response here, which is kind of fun. So let me turn all of these on. Great. Um, and I'll grab the SPL a little better here. You know, while you're doing that, I'll, I'll address one of Tim McCullough's questions here. So he was saying, so about routing signals to various clusters, pans, matrices, et cetera. Tim, if you can hold on to that question, I think we'll answer that really effectively when we get to spatialization and object-based mixing in the next lab, right? So hold on to that question because that's where it actually applies, if anywhere. And, you know, one of the secrets to the DSP spatialization boxes is they do some of this complex matrixing within it. That's how they're creating some of the spatialization. So hang in there with that question. You know, I, I saw a comment here, and I'll I'll tell a story on it, um, which is, you know, no one's going to want to pay for this. Um, but Robert, um, a, a good friend of mine, he's a a, a buyer for a, was for Summerfest for a long time, big festival in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Um, so a promoter buyer, and um, he actually uh, uh, was the the manager, the buyer for the Bradley Center in Milwaukee mm -hmm. four years ago or three, whenever that was, four years ago now, when we started the Lord Tour there. So we actually did the very first day of the Lord Tour um, in Milwaukee. And, and Lord was actually the first big pop music arena tour with Eliza. And I, text, I texted Doug and I said, hey, if you're around, you should come down and um, say hi. And, you know, he said, yeah, yeah, it's great to see you. And, and I didn't tell him what I was doing. And he, by the time you actually walked in, it was four o'clock and they were at full in rehearsal and lights were out. And he walked in and, and his response was, oh my gosh, I think it was a different word than that. What are you doing? This is the best <laughs> I've ever heard this room sound, right? Um, and then he said something else afterwards after he heard it and was like, and he goes, listen, my entire job is to buy experiences for people, right? And this experience is better than anything I've ever heard in this room. Um, it, it's a no brainer, right? You know, and he's the same guy who goes to all the ushers two hours before doors open and reminds them everyone here spent $80 to come in and have a good experience and goes to the hot dog seller and says, remember, everyone came here to have a good experience and goes to the, 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 <laughs> the, the security guard. Remember, everyone came here to have a good experience and they'll come back if they continue to have good experiences. Um, but for him, he's, he, I didn't prep him on it. I just said, Hey, yeah, I'm hanging out doing Lord. And that was his response was, wow, this is, this is really special. Um, and, and unprovoked, right? And that was mm -hmm. pretty neat. Um, so I dropped a couple of probes in while we were talking, or I turned them on, I should say. So probe here is giving us a transfer function measurement response of the system behavior at any given time. And it's culminating and adding these up. So we can actually see the response of mixed position, for instance, of just the center ray, and we can add on another signal. Once again, this is all pink noise, if you will. So it, it, it doesn't know that it's a different mix, but I think it's just as telling. And we can add these different ones and move it around. And so the big question is, is it totally consistent as we move side to side, right? Um, and, and yeah, it is. It gets wider to the sides, right? But overall, the frequency response looks quite similar side to side, front to back, right? Um, but that's with different signals. So if we were to do this exact same thing in stereo, which we all know the result is going to be probably. Um, let me just hide most of these. There we go. Let's see if I can find dead center. That's probably close to it. There it is. Yeah. Oh, I'm off by uh, Sounds fine where I'm sitting. 
Yeah, it's great here. It's great here. And then, of course, this is um, the band manager, right? Um, <laughs> no, that's the producer sitting, you know, six feet um, to your left. Yeah, and uh, this is know, the man. drummer's boyfriend or girlfriend. Oops. Um, <laughs> so there's that big thing in the low end that you're talking about. Now, it's, it's interesting. I always remind people that this happens at all frequencies. Your ears are just much more willing to accept it for multiple reasons in the high end. It's really obvious in the low end, right? Um, now, if you're smart, everyone, make sure you tell the producer or promoter this is where the camera platform is and you intentionally remove the low end so right. it wouldn't vibrate the We're platform. We're trying to help the camera guys. Yeah, yeah. Um, but as soon as we, you know, assign these signals different, so if you happen to mix stereo in 100% divergence, which no one would do, um, then it would be fine, right? Because mm -hmm. it's no longer a comb filter if it's separate instruments. Right. That's good stuff. Nice having some visual reinforcement of kind of what we're talking about there, man. I'll tell you that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it just kind of says, yep, you're right in what you're thinking there. It's cool. Yeah, it Show took me a while. Like, that's right. To get my head around that, that's for sure. And and, it, and same to everyone else, um, of panning speakers in is awfully bizarre. Uh, well, I, again, sure. I, I don't think I would ever do it, you know, in that situation if we were in stereo. You know, I, I didn't want to do it in, L, in LR because of both of those speaker systems carrying the same information, right? Now you're just creating more intelligibility problems there. But in immersive, they're not carrying the same information. That's that's the nuance of it, right? Yeah. Yeah, and and that's exactly it, right? Like we we mix in in mostly uh, you call it mostly mono? No, narrow stereo. Uh, wide, mono, wide, wide, mo wide mono. Wide mono. Wide mono. Wide mono. Um. And and that's exactly it. Like it, it's funny to me though. I always I, I've said this before. If anyone's heard me speak on this, but we spend a million dollars uh, in countless um, hours of our life um, walking around finding the best microphone that doesn't create distortion interference. Uh, of course, uh, everyone buys Avid S6Ls and all the other great consoles in the world to make sure they don't uh, add destructive interference on everything. And we timeline all the inputs to make sure there's no destructive interference. Um, hopefully everyone here bought acoustic speakers uh, so my kid can go to college um, also because they don't create interference or destructive in, uh, 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 scenarios. And then we design a terrible PA with the same signal and two speakers and put them far apart. Yeah. Right. Ain't it the truth, man. Ain't the truth. All right. Uh, well, I, have you got anything else there, Scott, that you want to no, hit upon? I, can... I just I want to keep us in some sort of time boundary here, if we can. I got a little bit more to go, but not much. So yeah, go for it. Um, I I stopped sharing there. If there's other questions see. I can try to answer as best as I can. Thank you, Scott. That was great. Yeah, no problem. It really it really makes it real <laughs> when you can see it, you know, and you can move it around. And that was great. Thanks. Let's see here. Absolutely. I got a kind of a question regarding the uh, low end um, dispersion in the uh, immersive versus, let's say, stereo, since sure. most of us have grown up with that. Typically, in a stereo array, the arrays are fairly long. And we know that the lowest frequency of a line array uh, that that array has directional control over is based on the length of the array. Now, in the immersive environment, I sort of have the impression that we are going to go with more arrays, but they're going to be shorter, possibly, arrays than two massive left and right arrays. So how does that affect as far as, say, since now we've got shorter arrays, some of the low end that's radiating off those arrays is going to be more of an omni-type uh, dispersion because the arrays are shorter. Uh, it, that could be possibly a problem for just the backwash say on stage, but also uh, as far as like noise mitigation within the area, noise pollution and that sort of thing. I mean, it, I mean, is that, is that a correct assumption or, or, or does that not even figure into it? No, I think that's a great question. And one that's definitely a challenge that we have to be cognizant of, right? So you're, you're right on twofold um, or one and a half fold. Let's start with that. So, um, traditionally, we we use uh, let's say 
Uh, I like to equate this into speaker dollars. I might use different speakers, but usually the budget's about the same of a left-right system versus a stage system. So um, if instead of uh, 50 uh, $1,000 speakers, I might use 100 $500 speakers. There's my math, right? And just distribute them differently. So yes, the arrays will probably be shorter, which inherently means less low-frequency directivity control because um, that is proportional to the length of the line. So that's problem one. So yes, there could potentially be more below. But secondarily, we're also putting the speaker cluster a lot closer to the person. And if we're tracking the object, they're always a lot closer to it, right? So if we think of our lead pop singer, he or she is running the stage. And if we're moving that object to each array that's closest to him or her, um, they're always close to the speaker creating the energy that has a little bit less directivity control. So that can be a problem. Right, so that's that's definitely something we need to be cognizant of from a design aspect, and that might inherently, you know, disadvantage an immersive environment over a left-right. Yeah. So you might say, "Hey, this I can't. I'm already on the bleeding edge of gain before feedback with my pop star, who doesn't hold the mic right and doesn't sing loud." Um, that being said, I will tell you almost always in a feedback scenario, it's not a function of amplitude but stability. So if you're running around and it's the same response everywhere, it's easier to get stability than if you move three feet and it changes drastically in response, right? So I found this to be a, probably not as severe looking as the modeling would show us because in modeling, I might go, oh my gosh, it's eight dB louder down here. But the reality is it's more stable because it's always the same level. So that's, that's probably a, a, a bit easier to deal with in, in that sense. Um, the second thing you brought up was noise. It's probably not a big difference. So when we talk about noise, we're talking about far field emission behavior, and that doesn't really change much. Um, and, and rarely is the vertical emission behavior and the low frequency controlled enough to ever be a concern anyways. So let's use the longest line source array I've ever flown, which is at the Hollywood Bowl. It's uh, 33 feet tall um, and it weighs six and a half thousand pounds, right? So it's as big as it gets. Um, the low frequency control is incredible on the stage, right? But in the vertical domain, it's a pretty soft edge, right? So we've not got a... Uh, uh, spotlight, we've got more of a par cam, right? So um, if someone's house was five degrees above it, if the array was smaller, it's not gonna have a big difference. Um, that being said, you get more bang for your buck with an immersive system. It feels louder when it's not. So we've found often people are mixing three to five dB less loud in an immersive environment than you do in a left and right, right? Yeah. So um, now at the end of the day, if you have the equal horsepower, you can still put it in the wall at hundred miles an hour equally as well. Um, there's not necessarily a difference there. It is harder, right? And immersive. And I think Robert will talk about this in the future. Um, you have to manage the resources a bit more and, and mostly mono, you just turn it up till the system runs out of gas. And immersive, if you put the bass and kick and snare and vocal and guitar all in the center array, and that array is a third smaller than your left and right, it's not gonna be as loud, right? Cause it's just, there's no headroom there for that, so. Sacrifice of power there. I, I would give you this uh, perspective as well, Winston talking about you know, a, a stereo versus an immersive thing on the backside of the PA. Let's talk about it on the backside, right? If those kind of interactions between stereo happen in the bottom end in front of the PA, depending on your pattern control, those interactions are going to happen behind the PA as well. Let's, let's just call it behind or, or below 300 hertz. And what that is going to create for you on stage is, as Scott mentioned, and I kind of gave it the thumbs up, is instability in the horizontal on the stage, right? As you walk across the stage, you're going to get a different perceived low frequency response from the interaction of the two arrays. I, I we went through this. I went through this forever on Petty because Ron Blair, the bass player, would his rig was set up right in the null, right in the low frequency null of the PA. You know, so uh, same sort of thing. And the opposite of that happened where Scott Thurston, one of the singers, etc., was all, because of his stage position was right in one of the humps back there, you know, so he, he was always, you know, kind of complaining or, you know, he could complain about low end, et cetera, when in fact it was just a function of his position behind the PA. I think that is way less an issue with immersive where you may only have low frequency elements exiting one speaker, right? You, you take away the interaction between multiple arrays and that goes for the back side of the PA as well as the front side. It would be great. I don't know, if, maybe Scott, I don't know if you can get to it quickly or if you can actually do it, but it'd be great to look at some of that interaction that we saw in the horizontal on the other side of the PA. Can you do that in sound vision? 
Oh yeah, give me a second. You keep talking. Tell a story um, <laughs> while we're there. Well, I, I'll I'll bring Winston into the discussion. Do you follow what I'm saying there, Winston? Because yeah. especially if you if you give up length and low frequency control, then interaction you've just moved the interaction up in terms of frequency on the backside of the array, right? I was kind of curious. I'm thinking about like say uh, uh, a big outdoor venue. Um, like so many of them have now, you know, our neighborhoods have grown up around them. And so now we've got problems with noise yeah. getting out of the venue. So being able to contain and, and define, you know, your coverage becomes a, you know, a, a really big deal. So when, if I'm flying two very large uh, left and right clusters, again, I have quite a bit of directional control over fairly low frequencies. And I'm looking at all these other clusters with shorter uh, lengths, and I'm just wondering how much now is of that low end n now not being so directional is now going out the back of the venue, for example. Well, yeah, I, but the, ver the vertical control you have in a low frequency, even with the largest line, is questionable at best, right? So you've, you've got, when you get a really long line, think of it not as a line source array, but as a directive point source. And like a directive point source, it's not a razor sharp edge you're cutting off, right? So at, you know, with you know, I don't know it's, with a 10 meter tall, 32 foot tall line array at 50 Hertz, it's, it's quite a soft edge. Right. Um, and, and so if you cut that in half, there isn't really much of a difference. And in fact, if you think about the, the person who was dead center versus the person who was on the edge, it's just 60 be less loud everywhere. Right. And yeah, it might be go a little further, but I've rarely had an issue where the vertical is the, the thing in the low end. Right. Cause if you think of Fort Hyde park in London and we're shooting across the park, four degrees up is someone's house, right? So 14 degrees up is above someone's house. That's not a problem. Um, in in mid-frequency control, you might get a little bit better behavior, um, but but it's it's just shifting the point up where that, that really sharp control happens. Um, and while you're speaking, I'm going to hit the share button. Let's see if this works. I would just say too, Winston, you know, keep in mind, you know, in terms of stereo behind the PA versus immersive behind the PA, you're probably going to have way less sources presenting information behind the PA in immersive, right? So yeah, I may sacrifice some control, but I've also greatly reduced the actual number of transducers presenting low end to the rear of the stage, right? So might be some trade-off there. That'd be, that'd be great to measure. I would love to do some measuring with that. And so the cool thing about it is you could do it if you had an immersive setup, set up at a festival, you could just say, well, let's look at it in stereo versus immersive and see what it's, what it's doing on the backside of the property, you know? Oh, that would be kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. The other thing to to keep in mind um, with stereo, I found one of the biggest problems I have with a stereo PA offsite, especially far field, is once again that random chaos between the left and right. So you'll have an issue with this band because, of course, their bass beat is at 52 hertz, which means <laughs> that vector of summation is 47 degrees off your downstage center. And then the next band is is 57 hertz. And so the vector changes slightly where that that node is for someone's house. And so you get situations where this this show just killed us. Our windows are rattling all night. And then it was better. What'd you guys fix? Well, the bass beat was just slightly higher frequency, which means the the two big arrays were were anti-noting, right? As opposed to noting. Um, so that's definitely something to keep in mind. So uh, Robert, you guys can see this again. Yes. Yes. No? yes. Okay, good. So I've modeled this is let me just hide the rest so we don't confuse ourselves. This is center array. And this is 50 to 200 hertz. So I just grabbed that two octave range. Right. And we can see let's turn what have I got red and green, red and green, let's turn blue off. So here is in front and here is behind. Right. So we definitely see the array is well controlled above 200 hertz. Um, in fact, we can see the the first artifact of the array or the first notch created. So this is the point where the line source is actually starting to create directivity is is at 80 hertz. And this is with a dozen boxes, I think. So it's not an it's not a small number, but it's not a large number either. Um, and, and so if you did your typical line array math, you would not come up with this number necessarily um, of 80 hertz. So it's it's still a bit lower. Um, and if we we're off to the side, so that's the question is let's pretend this is a well, I suppose I could do that. So here is is this dead center? Let's make that dead center. So this is dead center behind a single array, right? Um, and we can even gain match these in the front. Let's go to stereo, do the same thing instead. So let's just add snapshot to that. Great, cool. I'm gonna hide those, go back to you. 
So the only real difference, the actual low, low end, the 50, 60, 70 hertz stuff isn't much different in that position because left, right, you were off axis to the side, but you were summing, right, um, of two things. The higher band stuff was a bit different. That makes sense. You're not close to it anymore, right? And also in a line source, at least the size of K2, it's actually starting to become directional horizontally at about 100 hertz and above. Mm -hmm. So below 100 horizontally, it's not uh, so much just because of its physical size. Um, but the rest of it is. So it's definitely a, a concern, right? Um, so yeah, if I'm doing a, 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 an immersive environment, you know, really high gain before feedback, that could be problematic. We want to really vet that from a design perspective. Um, but I've not had a situation where that was a specific problem yet, including corporate, special event, so on and so forth. Or can, you, can you look at stereo in that same perspective? Yeah, let's solo that up. Hide those. Just kind of walk hide horizontally that. there. Yeah, so let me hide these so we don't mask that. Yeah. Right, so we see a modulation there happening, right? Yeah. But, you know, low end wise, it's not tragically yeah. different. There's a it's little not build up. terrible. No, it's not terrible in stereo, right? And if we go back to the sender immersive, because once again, there's one speaker, one source, right? Um, oop, I got those on still, I think. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, this is going to be my point is that. It's not, it's not much different, was it? It's really not much different. I, I'm surprised at that. I got to be honest. Yeah. I mean, now, once again, if you have a very large left and right and you go to, you know, something half the size, there will be a more of a difference there. Right. Um, but it's not, it's not that much different. Um, but yeah, definitely. The one thing to remember is you're, if you're localizing everything. So, Hey, here's my bass player in that array, right? It's going to be something like that versus, and even more so let's be extreme here. Our bass player is of course on oops, other side. Our bass player is right here, right? So our bass player is in this array, and so we get this kind of response behind the green, the green line there. Yeah. And we go to stereo. What's it going to be like? Because now he's not center, or she's not center, right? Yeah. So actually, it's once again, it's not tragically it's different. It's not terribly different. That's good. That's no. Cool. Oh, great question, Winston. Thank you. Yeah, that's good stuff. You know, really just trying to drive home the point here. All right, we're at, uh, you know, we're at about an hour 25 now. Uh, so I think what I'm going to do is pull some of the uh, presentation that I've got for, that I had set aside for the end of this, and I'm going to hold on to it till next week because it kind of skirts the line between being, you know, speaker system discussion versus being object-oriented discussion. And it has to do with the different types of systems that are out there to do this sort of thing. So we'll do that as the lead-in on the next lab and we'll just kind of wrap up here today. So let me get back to my screen here. Oops, there we go. Bring you back to it here. There we go. All right, so you know, if you just want to take a quick browse through those, sorry. Back. Oh, no, that's what we're going to cover next week. I'm sorry. Hang on, I gotta get my world together here. Come on, play along. Right, so where I was gonna go with this is that, uh, you know, the more things stay the same, the more they change, and the more they change, the more they stay the same. And for you guys that are familiar with this concept uh, from the Grateful Dead, the wall of sound, you know, immersive has kind of its DNA in this in terms of localization, right? in terms of intermodulation you know, or lack thereof uh, in wall of sound, right? So it same sort of principle here. This was just done, you know, exactly with the PA system and the inputs going to it. And as we'll see in the uh, immersive, uh, I mean, the object oriented mixing discussion, we can actually do something very, very similar to this really at the end of the day, if we want to do it, right? So yeah, kind of cool to have it go back in time. All right, so uh, let's talk about just some of the, the trade-offs, the immersive pluses and minuses here. And again, this is just to get you thinking about it. I'm sure there are more than I'm going to list here, but this is to get you thinking about it, okay? So immersive offers the trade-off of improved intelligibility and localization against a slightly compromised mix impulse in the acoustic space, right? We're going to sacrifice a little bit of propagation between instruments in order to create more intelligibility and more localization. That ultimately is what it boils down to, in my mind anyway. All right. 
Another important piece to understand here, and we're going to talk about this, this could actually drive a lot of conversation in the next discussion that we do, is that your mix impulse, even though you've sacrificed it a little bit in the acoustic space, is not compromised in any down mix that you do of console signals, you know, of objects. If you're going to down mix it to stereo or even to some other format that you want to down mix it to, as long as your channel latency is sorted out on your console, then there'll be no degradation of that mix impulse in your down mix. All right, so important concept to keep in mind. And hopefully Scott can come back uh, at the next lab and talk about this as well, because there are down mix capabilities in most spatialization devices, right? They will down mix for you. And I think it's a much better place to do it than actually doing it right off the console. So uh, we'll take a look at that as well. And then in terms of production real estate, you know, this is where it's, this is just going to take time, I think. This is just something of, you know, teaching old dogs do tricks. You know, we're, we're actually trying to coax productions into trading some, uh, you know, some low vertical space for high horizontal space, right? I, I guarantee you there are no productions in the world right now, especially ones that are so video centric that want big bananas hanging down into their screens for people that are, seated anywhere in the arena. They don't want it to block that sight line, right? So if we can get up above that, if we can hang these, you know, immersive, this front field immersive up above and, and still have downward coverage, uh, you know, that's a huge improvement to the visual landscape of the production. So that, that will be appetizing to them. And it may even play their hand a little bit in terms of paying for something like that as opposed to not paying for it. So there's, there's gold to be made there if we, if we mine it in the right way. Uh, yeah, as I say, this is a big plus for video screens. Now, an interesting thing about video screens, I, I think it's a challenge for us at some of these bigger shows in that it can actually have competing localization, right? We didn't really talk about this in the localization talk, but it, it begs the question, I, I, let, let's use an extreme example of it, right? If I have a guitar player that is moving all over the stage and I decide, you know what? It would be really cool to have a tracker on them. Or actually, let's use a vocal. Vocal is actually a better, maybe a better example of it. Because I, I have seen situations, Lord being one of them, where I thought that show would have been really, really well served by having a tracker on her vocal. And as she walked to one side of the stage, it would track with her. I, I thought that would be so effective. But there was not iMag on that show. I mean, if there's well, a 40, what, 40 by 60 20. video... Then I, then I may not want to use the tracker because my, my visual is anchored to the video there a little I'll bit. I'll jump in there Go real ahead. quick, Robert. Um, yeah. There was iMag for the first rehearsal. Aha. Uh -huh. and, and everyone went, whoa, that, that worked every other time because the PA used to be right next to the iMag. And, <laughs> and, and it was interesting. Um, we, I think it was first rehearsal. We turned it off after a few minutes and I was like, yeah. this is so much better. Not to, and it wasn't super high-end LED 60-foot wide wall. It was just projection iMag on the sides. And yeah. that went away. And it was interesting how much more everyone paid attention to her moving on stage. Right. right. Um, but uh, totally with you on that. Yeah. I, I mean, I'll say just on the, regard to that show, that was the tallest, most engaging vocal image I have ever heard in a PA system. I mean, it was unbelievable. I mean, I was sitting about 14, 15 rows back, and that vocal image sounded 50 feet tall. But the thing I started noticing is as long as she was dead center in the stage, it was great. It was, it was just fantastic. But then as she started to move off stage, you know, that image, this huge vocal image stayed and your visual shifted off one way or the other. And I, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I remember thinking, oh, my God, if they had the tracker on her right now, this would be unbelievable right now. Yeah, that was a, that was definitely a, a, a conservative choice. I mean, they had a moving fish tank. Um, they had a, a brand new PA. Right, they had all these things right. in it. Was, oh, it no, was, I, I totally get it. I totally yeah, get it. exactly. But, you know, all of a sudden it makes you think in different ways, you know, where, yeah. you know, in stereo, you wouldn't even probably wouldn't even think of the thought of putting her on a tracker. But in that situation, boy, it was applicable. You know? uh, let's see. The primary ch coverage challenge for immersive is, and I think Winston maybe kind of touched upon this a little bit, the vertical measured against the possible length of the line source, right? I mean, we're in a world right now where the vertical coverage capabilities are to some degree, to a, a good degree, dictated by the length of the line, right? So if we're... If we're Challenged with trim height, we may end up be, getting challenged in terms of the length of the line that we can hang above the production in order to properly cover the vertical. You know, so that that is one of the challenges for it for sure. 
And then, of course, the wraparound coverage, right? How do we make people that are out of the immersive zone still have a very viable and good sounding show? These might be people in the front field, you know, near the stage. They might be in the off stage, et cetera. How do we do that? And, you know, I, like I said, if Scott can come back with us at the next lab, we'll talk about how best to handle that. Do we do a flattened mono mix over there or do we do something that is actually spatialized but handled as a single output to a single speaker system, right? So uh, there's, there's choices there to be made for sure. And then finally, some considerations for future development, you know, talking about down the road, you know, out on the horizon, what can we see if this starts to get adopted would certainly be, does this drive a different type of speaker design, right? And I, I kind of alluded to it earlier, do we start going toward things with much higher Q meaning much wider coverage so that we can use them more effectively out in the wider portions of the soundscape and still have it be effective for bigger portions of the room, right? So will that drive that kind of movement? I think immersive has to get a much bigger footprint before we would start seeing that. But you, you have to start thinking that way if you think this is a viable way to do it. Um, more vertically nimble, meaning take away the demand for the line to be so long in order to cover the vertical, I, I, you know, I have Scott here and he knows what I think of L acoustic. So he's not, he knows this is not going to be a slight. That was one of the strongest suits for Anya and Anna in that situation is that the, the, the vertical coverage potential was not in any way predicated on the length of the line. You could take a very short line there and cover an entire vertical coverage. Now you didn't, may not have, you're going to sacrifice power, obviously, but in terms of coverage, you are absolutely able to achieve it, right? So are we gonna make, are we gonna bring that into play in more speaker systems that work uh, in immersive so that we can have shorter lines and still do you know, comprehensive coverage uh, in a vertical domain? Uh, wider overall horizontal coverage, I kind of touched upon that. Uh, for immersive, you know, for rear field immersive or surround immersive, you know, I think we're all game enough to understand, you know, only the, the most heady productions, the most money, you know, rich productions would ever consider, consider putting up full surround immersive with traditionally packaged systems, right? It would require trussing. It would require long power runs, long signal runs, whether it's speaker or uh, line level signal, et cetera. I mean, the logistics of it become really, really brutal for a day-to-day -day touring act. That said, if we could come up with something that is battery powered, I mean, we live in the era of Elon Musk, folks. We can come up with a battery powered speaker system that can last long enough for a concert, have the input driven to it, maybe RF driven, et cetera, just fly them up, turn them on and go to work, right? Easily steerable, et cetera. So, you know, in terms of a touring production that might want to consider full immersive, Maybe speaker manufacturers are thinking in those terms of building that kind of speaker system to do that, to cover that. Because remember, it may not need to be even powered on the entire time. Maybe you make it where it's a smart speaker system and only powers up when it sees input signal to preserve battery life. All these things are possible. They're just a matter of design uh, criteria, right? Uh, let's see, how do we channel here? This is another one. I think this is a considerable challenge. It's kind of one of those hidden ones that we don't, uh, maybe see and fully realize until it, you know, until we're right in the middle of it is for touring. How do we manage the challenge of moving from immersive to stereo, maybe even to mono, uh, which might be demanded of us depending on the venue logistics? Depending on, you know, I mean, we may not see immersive for a festival for a long, long time here, right? So even if we're out mixing immersive, we show up at the festival, we got to be able to easily get back to stereo in that situation, right? How do we manage that on the console? How do we manage that? Maybe maybe the immersive uh, spatializer handles that feed for us. There's all kinds of possibilities for there. One thing is for certain, we're going to have to manage it, right? We're gonna, it's something we're going to have to deal with. And, you know, do we now, I, I think I might have touched, touched on this briefly with Dave Morgan's comment, you know, uh, how do we, do we sacrifice seating in the 180? Do we make it a value add where people that are in the fully immersive zone actually pay for a more expensive ticket? You know, things like that. All of these things are possible. We just need to think them through, right? All right. So I think we've done all the discussion though, but we can certainly carry on some discussion here. 
but you know, I, it's a really interesting topic. I'm, I'm really engaged with it and really love talking about it. Like I said, I can't wait until I can get out and actually do this uh, in the field. So let me get my chat back. There we go. All right, so you know the rest of the time here is just set aside for a little Q and A. So you know, I mean, it's a lot to digest here today, and it's why I've broken it up into two or three labs uh, because there's two. Com you got to compartmentalize it a little bit. You got to treat speaker systems, and then treat consoles and approach mixing, uh, especially. And you know, and again, I think you have to contextualize it because mixing for live performance in a big space is a very, very unique animal with regard to this, right? Really, really unique. And we, ha we haven't even touched on the idea of object-oriented mixing for monitors yet. We'll hopefully get into that at some point as well. But, you know, this is a very particular thing and, and it, ha it carries a lot of demands and, and guardrails that maybe, maybe mixing for um, EDM might not have because there are no performers on stage, right? Then, then all bets are off. We can do whatever we want to do there. Uh, to some degree, with no penalties of propagation, et cetera, you know, with the exception of maybe mix, messing with the, the temporal aspects of the music. So, so a lot of good stuff there. So what do you think, guys? Uh, good lab today? Good, uh, good topic here for what we're talking about? Hey, uh, absolutely. Scott, what is, is there inherent latency involved with running Lissa? Uh, yeah, I mean, we'll probably get into that more next week, but it's it's just over three millisecond for the processor to do all of its magic. It's not really magic to do all of its thing. Um, yeah. So that's that's three millisecond on the scale event. That's not really problematic. Um, you know, as most of us end up putting twelve millisecond on the PA to begin with. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, three millisecond for that. But Thank it, you but it does all add up. I mean, it's a great question that you have yeah. to be aware of, and, and depending on how you spatialize. You know, like Elisa's got the luxury of being a, and we'll talk about this next week, being optimized for its system. I mean, it's it's optimized for that use. Whereas if you talk about something like, uh, and again, this is not necessarily to knock them, just to show it as comparison. If you were talking about something like Spat Revolution, which is doing all the spatialization inside a computer, right? A computer that's not designed to do it. It's just a software package yeah. running the spatialization. You would have to attach I.O. hardware to it there's going to be a buffer aspect to that computer running that spatialization. The latency challenges there are going to be much more different than it with Elisa, right? It's, there's probably going to be much more latency involved in that. No different than running a DAW with native plugins and all kinds of things on it. That is much more latent than running in a DSP environment, right? So, Well, uh, and as you mentioned before, having to, I mean, you're at a festival, you're running, you're, you're mixing it you know, object oriented, then all of a sudden you got a band coming in going, I don't know how to do that. Please put it back to stereo. Now, is there going to be yet another latency issue developed that you're going to have to, you know, work out for that? Uh, so obviously, that's... obviously when you're building this ahead of time, before the show ever happens, you need to test both. To yeah, I think sure you'll see it, it tomorrow that, you know, you in that situation, you would really, if you like, if you, as Scott used to always put it, if you want to go back to just boring stereo, <laughs> you can actually do that very easily from the console, right? I mean, if let's let's just play it out for a second. If you were at a festival and we had a five array front field immersive, and somebody wanted to come in and mix stereo, you just take their two objects, which is left and right, and apply them to one speaker or you know to two speaker systems, and now you're right back where you were before the immersive, right? There's no shift in. No shift in latency there, et cetera. You're just dictating that two of the speaker arrays are now going to mix immersive, or now mix in stereo as opposed to opening up the immersive to the mixer, right? If right, and, and, that, and that challenge is, is the biggest challenge there is if, if you've made each array smaller, you have less power, right? Right. So, so that's your kick, right? So you got to think about that. We, we do have a technique for getting most of the power out of the system. Let's call it that. Um, it's going to be close. It's not going to be exactly the same, but... Um, almost every opening act that's been with a headliner that had Eliza is mixed in stereo. Right. Um, and, and that's not for, I guess there's 12 reasons that can, you can imagine that that might be the case. Um, you know, a headliner gets the full lighting rig and probably gets the full audio rig. Right. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah so that's, that can be done just fine. We will definitely cover that Mike, Michael, in, uh, yeah, when we get well, to object oriented mixing, you'll see it because I'm actually going to give you, uh, an example of a hybrid of those two things, just to kind of bait the hook here a little bit. 
where you can actually have some bus-driven environment along with an object-oriented environment uh, in that in that immersive field, right? Yeah, right. Now, I saw someone had. Oh, go ahead. I, no, I could just see me production managing something. We're running Lisa. Now we've got to turn get it back down to stereo, and getting you know screamed at by the artist because it didn't have enough low end and you know what kind of company were we what kind of crap is going on here blah 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 and i don't need that in my day it's already hard enough it's uh, it's just growing pains brother i mean it's just growing pains you know yeah and and inherently the analysis system doesn't have less low end right i mean if if i choose to design one with it less that's one thing um, but the efficiency gains on low end in an immersive environment done properly is is borderline astronomical so I'll, I'll give I saw a question about it. So maybe I'll pivot to it real quick, Robert. I hope you don't well, mind. No, what, what I meant was kicking back down from the immersive to just stereo. Now, yeah. because you have less boxes in the string, you don't have as much low end energy, you know, so on and so on. Well, I, Michael, I didn't say that you did. So I'm not, I'm saying that you don't inherently have less low end in an Elisa system. And I'm also saying there might be techniques to get the most of the system back. Right. Like you yeah. would have had in the left, right. So, you know, we can leave that for another day in detail, but in, in generic here, keep in mind, if we put all the fat kids, pardon me, all the teenage boys jumping in the pool in one spot versus say festival one-on-one of doing a sub arc, your trade-off in low end efficiency is generally between six and 10 dB, which is somewhere between two and three times the sub count. So sub arcs are horrifically inefficient. So when you walk into a festival that has 48 subs in an arc, that's like having 16 in mono. Right, so that's the math. Now, so speak, if I fly, what's that? I would say, well, speaking of low end, what I, what I was kind of curious, what is the preferred, I guess, deployment of subwoofers for a system like that, and how do you time align that? And what do you what are you referencing to for the for the phase alignment between your tops and your subs? Yeah, I'll, I'll follow. I'll continue on to that question. So if we do a mono sub deployment, I think what everyone in this room say mono subs are the best if possible, when it's a mono PA. I'm not actually, I'm actually a, not a fan of mono subs with a stereo PA because you, you keep uh, spectral integrity, but you lose temporal integrity, right? So when you do a sub arc or you do a mono sub and a stereo PA, it's fine in the middle. You go to the side, it's way out of time, right? Um, and, and so now you're sacrificing, sure, I, I don't have the antinode, but I lost my alignment. So I have bad temporal between the, the two sources. With Eliza, at least, so this is L acoustic specific. Most others are doing something similar. Um, it's a single deployment of subs in the middle, right? And usually I try to put them directly behind, or if it's an arena, I actually can go in front and above um, the, uh, the, the center array. Um, and if you remember earlier, we talked about trying to keep the rhythm section tight, like in the center three arrays. So if you draw a little triangle there, everyone's pretty much equidistant, right? Or equidistant enough. You know, with subs, you can be off by four or five milliseconds and be okay with your subdomain alignment. Um, and that triangle tends to work out okay. So by doing that, we get equal temporal integrity across the audience and spectral integrity, and everything is always aligned. So you get really good efficiency. Um, so so Lord was a good example. Bon Iver actually, I think was, we did an arena tour of Bon Iver about a year ago, and that was 20 double 18s in an arena, which sounds like a lot for a little indie folk band, but they're actually one of the loudest LFE bands you'll see. Um, so, so that was 20 double 18s. And normally when they did left and right, they were usually 40 to 50 sub in an arena, right? Between flown and ground. But by being all in one place, we gained that efficiency and had much more consistent results. Yeah. All right. Well, I see a number of questions that are definitely going to get uh, dealt with next lab. You know, what about stereo inputs, et cetera? These are all object questions and mixing questions. How about you know, mixing to a summing bus versus no longer missing to a summing bus, et cetera. So yes, these are all the questions that we are going to attack at the next lab. You know, just sitting here thinking about the last couple of questions, Scott, I think it might be good for you and me to put together, maybe put our heads together a little bit and come up with uh, some presentation on the fill situation and subs. Yeah, I, I, I think mean, so let's, too. Because let's do let's do a sub evaluation. You know, of of these. Uh, you know, subsystems that would be used with each one of these and the fill requirements, front fill, off stage. Yeah, delays, field, um, delays, under balconies. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So that'd be worth probably another lab in and of itself, you know, to do that. Yeah, I think so as well. I mean, um, 
think it's a great point to remember is, is all of this is only valuable if we can dramatically increase the percentage of audience in that sweet spot. Yeah. You know, if it's, if we're just, you know, making a cool immersive environment for 15% of the audience, I don't know how valuable it is. Um, yeah. And, to, but I'll tell you something. I, I keep coming back to this. I mean, we're worse than that now with stereo. I, I'm, I'm with you on that. You know, um, well, it, the good news is the baseline is really low, right? So um, you've taken over for an inexperienced, never mixed before front of house engineer when you come into, sorry, I mean that as a stereo, <laughs> uh, 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 and you come into immersive, you have so much headroom. So that's the good news, right? Is is an average mix in immersive is probably better than a good mix in a in in stereo in terms of the quality for the room. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll we'll, we'll cover that a little bit in an object as well because I think it's kind of the uh, how do I want to say this. Kind of the golden goose for some workflows like house of worship and, and corporate things like that where you know there is no mix bus architecture you, you push up the fader you hear it out of the pa you know there's 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 certain workflows in certain situations where that's the right thing you know mm -hmm. yeah absolutely interesting all right guys uh well we're at almost two hours here so i'm gonna kind of knock it on the head here just to be able to keep the editing down to a reasonable amount of time <laughs> All right. So, uh, Scott, thank you so much for coming in. Yeah, man. It's me. so great having you here and, and being able to bounce, bounce this off of you. Really, really great stuff. I really appreciate you doing it and dedicating some time to it. So if I can get you back again, that will be fantastic. Be, I look forward to that'll it. That'll be yeah. gravy on the cake, as they say. All right. So, guys, thank you so much. Uh, the next lab will be two weeks from today. I'm sorry to space them out, but I've just got too many other duties in my life right now to be able to do them week over week. So they're going to have to go every other week for a while. Uh, and so we will see you two weeks from today for the next one. And it'll either be on fills, as we talked about today, or we'll switch over to object-oriented mixing. And I'll have some audio examples for you. I think I'll actually be able to let you hear some stuff binaurally if, if everything works out. And my buddy Scott helps me out there. We'll be able to listen to some binaural stuff across the web here. And I'll certainly print it in stereo or print it in binaural. So then when it comes back up on YouTube, it'll be in binaural there as well. So we can listen to that. That all sound good? That sounds great. Thanks, Robert. All right, my friends. We will see you in a couple of weeks. Have a great couple of weeks. Get back Thanks, to work. Robert. And we will talk to you later. All right. Thanks, Thanks Robert. Thanks, Scott. Cheers, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, gents. Appreciate it, Michael. Thanks.